property of Fourier transform which we had introduced yesterday and we will also close this chapter. So, we buy bid farewell to continuous Fourier transforms today. <coughs> the modulation property I said that if I have a product of two functions P of T S T then the Fourier transform of this is 1 over 2 pi convolution of P omega with S omega. We had proved this relationship <coughs> and we also tried to illustrate this with the help of an example. And the example that we had chosen was uh, P of t is equal to cosine omega 0 t or we chose the other way around. It does not matter. One of the functions is cosine which I can write as half of e to the j omega 0 t plus e to the minus j omega 0 t and therefore, its Fourier transform p omega is equal to 2 pi times half delta omega minus omega naught. So, it would be pi delta of omega minus omega naught plus pi delta of omega plus omega naught. In other words, it contains two impulses at omega equal to plus omega naught and omega equal to minus omega naught each of strength pi and therefore, pictorially our p omega versus omega is simply um, we have a impulse of strength pi at omega 0 and an impulse of strength same strength pi at omega equal to minus omega 0. Now, <coughs> what you have to do is to convolve this with s of omega and suppose s of omega suppose s of omega is a low frequency signal let us say like this band limited to omega 1 and minus omega 1 all right band limited to omega 1. <coughs> we have also tacitly assumed that omega 1 is less than omega 0. Now, if I convolve these two then what I get is s omega forget about the uh, multiplying constants multiplying constant is pi we will ignore that s omega you can reinstate this if you like s omega star delta omega minus omega naught is simply equal to s of omega minus omega naught. Similarly, s omega convolved with delta omega plus omega naught is simply equal to s of omega plus omega naught. In other words, what we get by convolution of p omega with s of omega are two such triangles centered at plus omega naught and minus omega naught. The result will look like this. If we call this r of omega which is equal to um, what was the multiplying constant 1 by 2 pi s omega convolved with p omega then <coughs> what we have is uh, we shall have two triangles like this like this centered at plus omega naught and minus omega naught. In other words the spectrum which was centered at origin which was a low frequency spectrum as far as capital S omega is concerned <coughs> the spectrum which was a low frequency spectrum like the audio spectrum for example, speech or music has now been transformed, transformed not transformed, transferred to a higher frequency omega naught all right and this is what we mean by modulation that is a low frequency is superimposed or used to modulate a higher frequency omega naught and it is this higher frequency <coughs> which contains all the information of the low frequency signal. The spectrum is intact means information is intact. Uh, this is now suitable for transmission through radio antennas. If you had to transmit the low frequency spectrum through an antenna, you would have to reach heavens. Uh, the height of the antenna would have to be extremely large and it would have posed a civil engineering problem. What one does is one transforms for example, FM is typically in the range of 107 megahertz the Delhi, Delhi transmission is 107 megahertz whereas the audio, audio band ends at 16 kilohertz 16 hertz to 16 kilohertz. 
So, 16 kilohertz, this band is superimposed on 107 point, 107 point something, I do not remember, that uh, frequency for modulation and then it is transmitted. The other transmission that you get in the medium wave is amplitude modulation transmission and this is what we are talking of here. That is multiplying a high frequency signal by a low frequency signal causes an amplitude modulation and in the, in the frequency domain this is the picture, this is the spectrum. Suppose you transmit this and then you want to receive it at some point, all right. You transmit this to a distant location, then one wants to recover the audio frequency. Uh, a very simple, method. there are many methods which you learn in the principles of communications, communication engineering uh, in, the, in the third year. Now, uh, a very simple method would be that you simply convolve this, that is whatever you get here, suppose this is R of T, this is the signal that you receive in a receiving antenna. All right. Then what you do is you multiply R of T by again the same high frequency called the carrier because omega 0 carries on it the low frequency spectrum. So, this is called the carrier. You just multiply by the carrier. This is one of the very simple methods. Many alternative methods will be learned later, but one of the simple methods is this. Now, if you multiply this by cosine omega 0 t in the frequency domain, what you are doing is you are convolving this again with, with two impulses in the frequency domain, one at omega 0 and the other at minus omega 0, all right. Now, if you convolve this with this as well as this, obviously, you shall get two spectra. Similarly, from here you will get convolve, convolution of this with this, the impulse at omega 0 and the impulse at minus omega 0. That will also create two such triangles. But interestingly, two of these triangles will be at low frequency. You can see this that uh, <coughs> uh, S omega star, I beg your pardon, R omega star delta of omega minus omega naught would be simply R of omega minus omega naught. In other words, this will be shifted to twice omega naught instead of omega naught. This will be shifted to twice omega naught. And the other one would be if you convolve this, if you convolve R of omega with minus omega naught, then what do you get back? You get back S of omega. Isn't that right? And similarly, if you if you convolve this triangle with both of these, there shall come another exactly similar spectrum. And therefore, the result of this would be, I am uh, omitting the details of calculation, result of this would be you get back the original low frequency and you get two other triangles which are centered at 2 omega naught and minus 2 omega naught and this is centered at 0. The heights shall be different because multiplying constants we have not taken into account. In fact, the height of this will be twice. If this is half, then this would be one quarter. Can you guess why? Two terms are being superimposed on each other, two identical terms, so it becomes double. So, if this is one quarter, then this becomes half. And then what do you do? You see, you have got back the original uh, low frequency spectrum, but you also have the high frequency. So, what you have to do is to make, is to construct a low pass filter, that is a filter which passes low frequencies, let us say 0 to some value omega c, which is greater than omega 1, greater than or equal to. That is, you pass this spectrum through a spectrum window, which discards the high frequencies and retains only the low frequencies. And this is what then you amplify in an audio amplifier and power and and enhance the power by means of a power amplifier, put it to the stereo and uh, and listen to it. This is the process. So, modulation is an extremely important property of Fourier transforms and one should understand this carefully, not only for Fourier transforms sake, but also for later use that is uh, <coughs> in communication. Let us look at another uh, another example of modulation, R of t equal to P of t S of t. And suppose my 
my S of t, the signal, is some arbitrary signal like this. Let us say, <coughs> let us say an arbitrary signal like this. This is my P of t, P of t versus t, all right. And let us suppose that S of t is a sequence of impulse functions, that is delta t minus k t, where k goes from, let us say, minus infinity to plus infinity. It is a chain of impulse functions. That is, this looks like, looks like this. It is a chain of impulse functions. It starts at k equal to 0, then capital T, 2T and so on and so forth. Now, if I multiply this function by the delta function, well, what actually happens is the following. Uh, <coughs> R of t is equal to summation delta t minus k t multiplied by p of t. What did I assume? I assume this to be s of t, right, p of t. And therefore, I can, since the delta function exists only at t equal to k t, I can write this as uh, summation p of k t multiplied by delta t minus k t where k goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. Is that okay? Which essentially means that I am sampling out the values of the function p of t at regular intervals of time. In other words, what I am doing is I am converting the given signal p of t, the given signal p of t into a discrete time signal. This discrete time signal occurs at regular intervals of time. That is, what we get at the output of this, at the output of the multiplier is impulses like this at regular intervals of time whose strengths are equal to the value of p of t at those instants of time. These are 0, capital T, 2T and so on and so forth. So, what in effect we are doing is from a given whole, we are sampling the values of the signal. So, this process is called sampling and the sampling is being done with the help of a chain of impulses and therefore, this is called impulse sampling. As you shall see later, this is the heart of all digital communication. This is the heart of digital signal processing and we shall have a closer look at sampling a little later. But you see sampling also is a manifestation of the modulation property of Fourier transforms. Now, what happens? Let us see. If we do this sampling, <coughs> then what happens in the frequency domain? You see, what we are doing is we are multiplying R of t. <coughs> R of t is S t p t, where p of t is equal to summation delta t minus k t. k goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. And if we can find out capital P of omega, um, R of t is S t p t. If we can find out capital P of omega, then the spectrum of the resulting signal would be simply 1 over 2 pi P omega convolved with S of omega, all right. Now, <coughs> P of t is equal to delta t minus k t, k equals minus infinity, have again I have again made a mistake. This is S of t. S of t. I should make a correction here also. This is S of t. Okay. I am sorry for the mistake. All right. <coughs> now, as you see, S of t is a periodic function. It is a regular chain of impulses at regular spacings, regular intervals of time. So, it is a periodic function and we have already done the Fourier series for this. The Fourier series for this, well, S of t is, what are the coefficients? The coefficients are all 
1 by t. Coefficients are all 1 by t and therefore 1 by t e to the j k omega 0 t k goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. This is the Fourier series where omega 0 is equal to twice pi over t. All right. This is the Fourier series. We have already done that. We also know that the Fourier transform of e to the j k omega 0 t is simply twice pi delta of omega minus k omega 0. And therefore, if s of t is the chain of impulses <coughs> that is delta t minus k t, k goes from minus infinity to plus infinity, then capital S of omega is equal to summation, well, 2 pi by t, 2 pi comes from the Fourier transform of e to the j k omega 0 t delta omega minus k omega 0, k is minus infinity to plus infinity. The, in, the interesting thing is that the chain of impulses in the time domain transform into a chain of impulses in the frequency domain. This if you plot this in the frequency domain, it would be simply a chain of impulses like this. You have an impulse here, impulse here and so on. zero omega zero two omega zero three omega zero and so on minus omega zero and so on okay so a chain of impulses in the time domain transform transforms into a chain of impulses in the frequency domain now let us suppose that my signal p of t is uh, some arbitrary signal such that its capital p of omega is band limited let's say it is like this we, we always take a band limited signal like this. This is a hypothetical signal. It is only for illustration. Suppose p of omega is band limited to omega 1 and minus omega 1. What you have to do now is to is to convolve this with a chain of impulses in the frequency domain. That is you have like this omega 0, 2 omega 0, 0 then minus omega 0 and so on. Obviously, the convolution would be p of omega minus uh, p of omega convolved with delta omega is simply p of omega. p of omega convolved with delta omega minus omega naught would be p of omega minus omega naught and so on. So, what happens is this spectrum by convolution with a chain of impulses in the frequency domain is converted into a periodic function. Is not that right? Which, which repeats at regular intervals of frequency and this interval is equal to omega naught. Let us suppose, well let us let us draw the picture and see what happens. <coughs> A picture therefore shall be like this. What we are plotting is uh, r of omega which is the convolution of p omega with s omega and of course there is a factor of 1 by 2 pi. Let us ignore the uh, multiplying factors. The shape of the spectrum shall therefore be something like this. This is uh, 1 then the next triangle, then the next triangle and so on. It repeats at regular intervals of time and the ordinates are this is 0, this would be omega naught, this would be 2 omega naught and so on. Please remember omega naught is 2 pi divided by t, where capital T was the distance between two impulses in the time domain for the signal S of t. All right. Now, this is omega 1 and this is omega 1, all right. And what is this frequency? Omega naught minus omega 1, all right. Now, <coughs> you have to consider two situations. One is, if these two triangles superimpose on each other, then obviously the shape of the spectrum changes. Shape of the spectrum changes. For example, if this superimpose like this, 
all right then the shape of the spectrum would be something like this all right it will have triangles on the top but it will have flat portions on the other hand if if these two do not superimpose on each other then the shape of the original spectrum of p of omega is retained and if necessary you can recover this spectrum by means of a low pass filter that is a filter which passes only let's say this block of frequencies and cuts off the rest in a sense what we have discussed now through this modulation is the so called sampling theorem the sampling theorem says that if you sample a continuous time signal then all information of the signal is contained in the sample signal all information is contained in the sample signal provided the end provided the end of this spectrum does not overlap with the next spectrum what will be the condition for this omega 0 minus omega 1 must be greater than omega 1 that is omega 0 should be greater than twice omega 1 and what is omega 0? Omega 0 is the sampling frequency. The sampling interval was capital T. So, 2 pi by T is the sampling frequency in radians per second. The sampling frequency therefore must be greater than twice the highest frequency content. Omega 1 is the highest frequency content of the signal. And this is the statement of the famous sampling theorem due to Nyquist N Y Q U I S T Nyquist Nyquist stated that if you sample a given continuous time signal at a frequency which is at least twice the highest frequency content of the signal then the spectrum of the signal remains intact or undistorted the only thing happen that happens is that it becomes repetitive, it becomes periodic. However, you can extract the signal back if you pass it through a low pass filter like this. You shall be taught sampling theorem, uh, at least the statement, at least the statement once again in this course, later when you do sampling, you will, you will be asked to recall in the course on digital signal processing, if you take that course, you will be asked to recall this in your principles of communication, you will be asked to recall this in digital communication. There are a number of, uh, and also in digital control, where sampling is a must. Wherever sampling is important, one must remember that the sampling rate must be at least twice the highest frequency content of the given signal, at least. There can be an equality sign also. We usually avoid an equality sign. Okay? Can you guess why? Because filtration would be difficult. Not only that, there is no practical signal which is band limited. In other words, actual signals would be something like this. Would be something like this. So, if you super, if you, if this edge coincides with this edge, it means that there will be substantial distortion. Well, one of the things is that because no practical signal is band limited, distortion is a must. You cannot avoid this. The only thing you can do is to keep it to as low a value as possible. All right. Uh, so, what one usually does is since no practical signal is band limited, for example, the, the telephone signal, the telephone, uh, the audio signal in the telephone, if it is to be transmitted by digital telephony, digital communication, then you must band limit the signal. 16 kilohertz is too high. So, one band limits to 3.3, .3, that is the standard range. Telephone message uh, transmitted by digital telephone, which is most of the case now, um, digital telephony is band limited to 3.3 .3 kilohertz and is sampled at the rate of the least, the lowest rate that you, that you need is 6.6, .6, but it, it is kept at 8 kilohertz, that is the standard value for sampling an audio signal to be transmitted by digital telephony, 8 kilohertz. So that there is a safety margin of how much? 
Kalahari. Okay. This safety margin is allowed so that uh, the um, the trailing end becomes negligible. In other words, you can approximate this by means of a triangle. All right. So this is why um, omega one, omega zero is usually kept greater than two omega one, not exactly two omega one. In theory, this is possible. But in practice, since no signal is band limited, therefore it is required that there be what is called a guard band. This band of frequencies from omega 1 to omega 0 minus omega 1 is called the guard band. It guards against, it guards against the distortion that might occur if omega 1 was exactly equal to omega 0 minus omega 1. But if you were <coughs> not too careful about your system design, you may ignore Nyquist's band or Nyquist restriction. If you do, then obviously your spectrum shall be distorted and there is no way that you can recover the original spectrum or the original signal or the message from the transmitted sampled version of the message. And the distortion that arises is known by the name of aliasing distortion. You shall learn more about this later. But as far as the theory is concerned, do not ask for the theory again. It shall not be done. It will simply be referred to as uh, the sampling theorem and the sampling theorem is not obeyed, then it is called aliasing distortion. And the meaning of the word aliasing means that high frequencies pose as low frequencies and low frequencies pose as high frequencies. So, it is called aliasing distortion. <coughs> Finally, before we bid farewell to the topic of Fourier transforms, well, we would um, like to work out a number of examples uh, in the time that is left and um, emphasizing the concept of frequency response. I told you yesterday that the frequency response h of omega is the Fourier transform of h of t and therefore h of omega is as good a characterization of a linear time invariant system as good a characterization as h of t. All right. If x of t is given, h of t is given then y of omega is equal to x of omega h of omega and therefore, y of t can be obtained as the Fourier transform of capital Y of omega. This we discussed yesterday. Now, basing on this, we shall work out a number of interesting examples. One is, first of all, the most general situation is that you have a k for a continuous time system, d k y t, d t k, k equals 0 to let us say capital N is equal to the most general characterization of an LTI continuous time system is k equal to 0 to m b k d k x of t d t k. And in the last tutorial class you have seen what happens if m is greater than or equal to n. There are complications. Delta functions are introduced. You will see that if you take Fourier transform, then uh, the considerations are much more, much simplified as compared to working solely in the time domain. The first thing we notice is that h of omega, the frequency response can be very simply written by inspection. If you take the Fourier transform of both sides and if you remember that dy dt transforms as j omega times capital Y of omega, then you simply see that uh, what we shall have is a polynomial in the numerator and a polynomial in the denominator and this polynomial would be a k, a k j omega to the power k where k goes from 0 to capital N and this would go from 0 to capital, capital M b k j omega to the power k. Is this clear? Is this obvious? It is not obvious. All right. Let us take an example, uh, non trivial one. <coughs> Let us say y 2 dot plus 6 y dot plus 9 y. We shall come back to this example later. 
x2 dot plus 3x dot plus 2x. Let us consider an example of a differential continuous time uh, system. Now, you see, if you take the Fourier transform of both sides, of course, we assume initial rest. If you, if you take the Fourier transform of both sides and you say that y of t transforms to capital Y of omega and x of t transforms to capital X of omega, then you know that y of omega should be equal to capital H of omega multiplied by x of omega, all right. Capital H of omega is the frequency response which is the Fourier transform of the impulse response. So, which means that the frequency response can be obtained by taking the ratio of y of omega to x of omega, all right. This is what we are doing here. Take the Fourier transform of both sides. Then we get j omega squared capital Y for the first term. For the second term, 6 j omega y capital Y plus 9 capital Y is equal to j omega squared capital X plus 3 j omega times capital X plus 2 capital X, all right. Is there any question on this? We have used the property that d dt of x of t, this transforms as j omega capital X of omega. This we have proved already. All right. Can you go ahead? Okay. And therefore, if you take the ratio of y to y of omega to x of omega, which by definition is h of omega, what you simply get is the following. You get j omega squared plus 6 j omega plus 9 and in the numerator you get j omega squared plus 3 j omega plus 2. All right. It is conventional, instead of writing j omega every time, it is conventional to write this as s squared plus 3s plus 2 divided by s squared plus 6s plus 9 under the condition s equal to j omega. So, you see the frequency response function h of omega can be written down by inspection. In general, if I have summation a k d k y d t k equal to summation b k d k x d t k. If this is the general equation of the linear time invariant system, then obviously h of omega is what I wrote earlier that is summation a k s to the k summation b k s to the k under the condition s equal to j omega. Is this clear now? For a general system, we can obtain the frequency response function by inspection. Uh, Let us take some, some simpler examples. <coughs> we have y dot plus a y equal to x. Let us say we consider an LTI system which is like this. Then if I take uh, what is h of omega by inspection 1 divided by the coefficient is 1 divided by s plus a under the condition s equal to j omega all right and because h of t is the fourier pair of capital h of omega the finding of impulse response now is simply amounts to inverting h of omega and we already know what the inversion of h of omega is it is e to the minus a t u of t this is a much simpler method of finding the unit impulse response of a linear time invariant continuous time system let's take another example <coughs> slightly more complicated y2 dot plus 2 y dot plus y equal to x dot plus 2x, all right. I want to find the impulse response of this. In the tutorial class, we, we told you that what you do is you first find out the unit impulse response of the system when the right hand side is replaced by x and then apply the principle of superposition. You can do that or you can also do it like this. 
If you want to work in the frequency domain alone, if you want to work in the time domain alone, that is the best method. That is, replace the right hand side by x and then apply the principle of superposition. If you want to work in the frequency domain, then this is a much simpler method because your run, your frequency response function now becomes s plus 2. I am writing by inspection s from this first differentiation plus 2 divided by s squared plus 2s plus 1 with s equal to g omega. All right. Now, this is s plus 2 divided by s plus 1 whole squared under the condition s equal to g omega. I do not know the inverse transform of this. What I know is the inverse transform of 1 by s plus 1. I know the inverse transform of 1 by s plus 1 whole squared. The function shall be multiplied by t, all right, or 1 by s plus 1 whole cubed. I know that too. The function shall be multiplied by t squared and so on. So, the first thing that we do is to expand this in those kind of forms. That is, I write a by s plus 1 plus b by s plus 1 whole squared. I do not want anything else than a constant in the numerator. How do you find a and b? Pardon me? Both are 1 here. But how do you find it in general? What you do is you write the numerator of this and equate to s plus 2. Then you find out a and b by equating coefficients of like powers of s. And the result is, in this case, both are 1 and therefore, uh, is that right? S plus 1 whole squared. Yes, you are right. Under the condition S equal to g omega. This is h of omega and therefore, now I can invert term by term. For this, it would be e to the minus t u t and for this, it would be t e to the minus t u t. So that is the final, final result for the impulse response. We <coughs> conclude this lecture by working out an interesting problem from the text 436. 436 says part A, it is a fairly long problem but a very interesting one and simple too. 436A says there are two systems h of t and g of t which are cascaded that is one comes after the other all right h of t g of t and it is said that h of t and g of t are inverses of each other they are inverse system that is if you invert h of t you get g of t not fully inverse it is the inverse system now Inverse system means that if this is x of t, then the output should be x of t, all right. So, the question is, what is the relationship between h of omega, that is the Fourier transform h of t and g of omega? Obviously, the product should be equal to? Should be equal to? No, it should be 1 because what you are doing here is h t convolved to g t and this becomes a product in the frequency domain. And therefore, all that you get is h omega multiplied by g omega equal to 1. This is the answer to the first question. Second part, is this, is this understood? No. Okay. Let us go to the frequency domain. Capital X of omega. You have h of omega. You have g of omega. We go to the frequency domain. And then this is x of omega. Now, how is this possible unless this product is equal to 1? All right. In the time domain, it is h t star g of t and the frequency domain is the multiplication of the two. So, the multiplication is equal to 1. Is it okay? All right. Now, we are going to more complicated problems. We have a linear time invariant system, part B, LTI system whose frequency response is of this form. It is 1 for 2 less than mod omega less than 3 and 0 otherwise. All right. Which means that uh, if I plot it, it looks like this.
Okay, this is my uh, h of omega. This is two and three minus two and minus three, and here it is one. The value is one. This is my h of omega, the frequency response. The question is, is it possible? Is it possible to find an input x of t such that? Follow the question carefully. Such that the output is of this shape y of t is a triangle like this, 1 and 1. Is the question clear? It is a bit uh, unconventional question. Let me repeat the question. Question is, <coughs> you are given a linear time invariant system to which you apply an x of t and the output is y of t. The system is characterized by, not by its impulse response, but by its frequency response. And I told you the frequency response is as good a description of an LTI system as the impulse response. So, this should be good enough. H of omega is 1 for a band of frequencies 2 to 3 and it is 0 otherwise. Question is, can you find an X of t such that Y of t is of this form? Y of t is simply a triangle like this. This is the question. If you can find, find one. If not, say why you cannot find. That is the question. All right. <coughs> now, uh, the solution of this in terms of Fourier transforms is like this. Your y of omega is equal to x of omega times h of omega. All right. And let us take a particular frequency, let us say 0, dc. You know, think about such problems a little bit before you come to a solution, but it is extremely simple really. Y of 0, just one spot frequency. You see, if it is possible, if it is possible, then um, <coughs> one example is not sufficient. But if it is impossible, one example, one counter example is, so we are trying to construct a counter example. Let us see if it works. Y of 0 is X of 0, H of 0. Now what is H of 0? 0. And therefore this is equal to 0. Now required Y of T, required Y of T is this, 1, 1. So one method would be calculate the Fourier transform of this and see if at DC, if at omega equal to 0, the value is 0 or not. But you see, calculation of Y of 0 does not require the computation of the Fourier transform. Why not? Because capital Y omega by definition, now follow this carefully, it is YT e to the minus J omega T DT. Can you go back? Okay. The calculation of y of 0 does not require the computation of y of omega, totally. Because if you look at the definition, y of 0 is simply minus infinity to infinity y of t dt. That is the area under the curve. What is the area? Half. Now, what is the answer there? not possible because y of 0 is 0 and y of 0 here is half and therefore the answer is it is impossible to find an input for which the output shall be of this form. The next part of the problem <coughs> uh, next part of the problem B2 the same problem that is uh, h of omega is band limited, that is 1 for omega between 2 and 3 and it is 0 otherwise. Question is, is it possible to, to design an inverse system of this? Is it possible to design a system which is inverse to this system? 
Answer? No. Because the inverse system should have a frequency response which is 1 by h omega. And 1 by h omega is not defined outside this range 2 and 3. And therefore, the answer is no. No inverse system can be uh, found out. Part C. <coughs> Part C concerns a, a practical problem, an auditorium. An auditorium in which music is being recorded. And this recording shall be sold in the market. But the auditorium, unfortunately, is a poor auditorium. In other words, there are echoes. All right? An auditorium has echoes. And so, if you, sub, if you, <coughs> if there's an impulse of sound at some instant of time, it repeats after regular intervals. All right? So, what you get is um, <coughs> delta t is the input, then it's added to, let's say, uh, delta t minus t with some attenuation alpha because the sound, let's say, goes back, goes to the walls and then gets reflected, some attenuation alpha, then it gets alpha squared delta t minus 2t and so on and so forth. And therefore, if alpha is not sufficiently large, Sufficiently large or sufficiently small? small sufficiently small. small. The music that you record is a distorted version of what was actually played, what was actually sung by the singer. And therefore, uh, such recording, if you want to make a gramophone record out of it or a video or a, a cassette out of it, well, uh, nobody is going to buy this because it's, it's very noisy. So, what people have to do. On the other hand, you know, in public auditoriums, uh, let's say Sri Ram Bharatiya Kala Kendra or even our seminar hall, one cannot ensure that there is no echo. So, uh, if, you want, if you want, let's say, Ali Akbar to play here and his music to be recorded and sold in the market, well, the gramophone companies, what they have to do is to process this signal such that the echoes are removed. All right? It's a question concerning that. Now, uh, what is given is that the auditorium's impulse response, h of t, is given by summation k equal to 0 to infinity e to the minus kt delta t minus kt. <coughs> In other words, the attenuation is e to the minus t. One time attenuation is e to the minus t. All right? <coughs> what one wants is, if this recorded music is to be made distortion free, what is the processing that is needed? All right. Obviously, the concept of inverse systems can now be brought in. All right. What we do is, <coughs> this is our signal, the, what the singer sings, and then you have the auditorium. <coughs> whose impulse response is h of t, it is not simply a delta t, but it is a um, continuation of echoes. And then the processing that you need is, you need another LTI system having the impulse response g of t such that at the output you get x of t. X of t. And therefore, g of t and h of t should be inverses of each other. Now, if you consider h of t, which is summation infinity k equals 0 e to the minus k t delta t minus k t, you notice that its h of omega, its h of omega is simply, yes? What would it be? Well, if you expand this, it is delta t plus delta t minus t plus etc. to infinity. So, if you take h of omega, then you get 1 plus e to the minus j omega t plus etc. to infinity. And therefore, h of omega would be simply 1 by 1 minus, <coughs> no, I made a mistake, e to the minus t, that should be introduced, all right. So, it would be e to the minus t and so on. Now, if you, if you, <coughs> if you sum up this, this is a geometric series you get e to the minus 1 plus j omega times capital T. I am sorry, let me write this in big. 
h of omega becomes 1 by 1 minus e to the minus 1 plus g omega times t. So, in order to recover the original music, all that you have to do is to design an inverse system whose g omega is given by 1 minus e to the minus 1 plus j omega t. And if you, if you take the inverse Fourier transform, what kind of impulse response do you want? You want an impulse response which is equal to, yes? For the first term, for unity, what is the in inverse? Delta t minus e to the minus t, I beg your pardon, j omega is here, e to the minus t, then e to the minus j omega. What is the inverse Fourier transform? Delta of t minus 1. No, capital T. E to the e to the minus j omega capital T, so delta of t minus t. This is the impulse response that you want. Alright? And it's not impossible to design a system which has an impulse response <coughs> like this. And this is why the dumbphone companies are in existence in the market. Because they cannot guarantee that the studio would be eco free. And if it is a, a, a an open auditorium, yes. You can almost guarantee. Not in the open air theater that you have in IIT. It has a lot of reflections and so on. All right. This is, uh, with this we bid farewell to the <coughs> topic of Fourier transform. Next time, Fourier transform for continuous time system. Next time we take up discrete time system.